Now we're going to talk about the basal ganglia and its role in action selection and cognitive action selection. This is a very nice diagram from Rich Ivory and colleagues uh, that gives a kind of picture, intuitive understanding of how the basal ganglia acts as, again, this kind of inhibitory wall um, blocking uh, possible actions that might be taken that the cerebral cortex in this case is kind of coming up with a bunch of different possible actions that you could perform and the basal ganglia is kind of saying well which of these different possible things should we do let's pick one of them and here it says the most active it may not be the most active it's probably the in our framework it's the most rewarding uh, response the one that's most likely to lead to a, a good reward uh, is or at least a, not a negative outcome is the one that is kind of selected and once it's selected then that particular kind of channel is opened up another way of thinking about it is kind of a train track selector you know, you're, you're picking which of these different ones kind of gets to go through and complete the circuit and finish uh, and actually perform the action so under this model, the, the cerebral cortex is kind of cerebral, it's thoughtful, it's kind of in a little bit in the clouds, dreaming of different possible ideas. And the basal ganglia is really that kind of hard-headed decision maker that's like, yeah, that's not going to work. This is too crazy. That's too risky. That's what we're going to do. We're going to do this. And so it's really this more hard-headed, uh, reward-focused uh, kind of decision-making system that ensures to the extent possible that your decisions are consistent with kind of more grounded estimates of how well things might actually turn out. So that's a good picture for understanding how these two systems work together. And in that picture you can see that it's really a integrated system. You don't have one without the other. You need the cortex to kind of come up with the possible ideas. Again, it's going to have a lot more detail, just like we talked about with the cerebellum. It's the basal ganglia is playing a modulatory role. Again, we'll see it has this disinhibitory type of uh, relationship. So it's kind of modulating. In this case, it's kind of choosing which of these things gets to happen. And it's interesting, uh, in popular literature, there was some uh, results suggesting that when people became consciously aware of their decision to act, it was actually some 300 milliseconds or so after activity in the basal ganglia fired, suggesting which action was going to be taken. And so this is consistent with this, this model that says basically you're thinking of a lot of things you could do, but it's really that basal ganglia that kind of starts the process finally and says this is what we're going to do. But the reaction was like, oh, that's gross. I have this basal ganglia in my brain that's deciding what I'm going to do. And it's really this kind of fundamental connection we have with our subjective conscious experience. We associate that with who we are, right? It's very natural. It makes sense. But the basal ganglia is you. It's your basal ganglia. It's your entire history of life experience of rewards and punishments, good outcomes, negative outcomes, fears, everything that's shaping that system. It is you. And so <laughs> you are making your decisions. Um, it's just a different part of your brain. The weird part is you're not consciously aware of it. The reason you're not consciously aware of it is because like the cerebellum, it is a feed forward circuit it does not have this kind of attractor recurrent dynamics. And if we think that's critical for consciousness, then that makes sense that you're not consciously aware of what's happening in the basal ganglia. And so it is the case, as these studies have shown, that essentially your brain, you, are making decisions sort of prior to your conscious awareness that you've actually made that decision. And that's because your basal ganglia is this kind of primary location where your decisions finally get really made. So it's a little weird. It's a little weird. I'm not going to say it's not weird, but uh, that's how it works, but it's you, so don't worry about it. <laughs> There's a little cartoon for how the basal ganglia works, and you know, this very popular notion of the kind of devil and the angel, kind of these two different courses of action you might be considering, um, battling it out in your mind. Which should I do? Should I do this? Should I do this? you know, that kind of go, no-go decision is really what the basal ganglia is doing. And interestingly, in the circuit, there are separate neurons 
part, that are part of the kind of no-go pathway distinct from the go pathway. And we'll see that in fact they have different relationships to dopamine, which is really the signal that is training the basal ganglia to do the right thing, okay? So it's not the case that like no-go is always the angel and go is always the devil, even though that's kind of in this scenario typically what happens. But anyway, what's interesting is that you do have these two competing, again, we go back to this tug of war, they very much have the same kind of tug of war competing relative dynamic trying to choose what to do. The dopamine system is wired so that it reinforces a go decision. And so the idea here is that if you get some kind of positive reward signal encoded in dopamine, and everybody's heard about dopamine, we'll talk a lot about what dopamine is actually encoding and what it's not encoding in a moment. But just for this, for the time being, let's just think of it as a kind of positive reward signal. What this is basically saying is, if you get some positive outcome by having, in fact, already made a go decision, and this is critical, so you kind of make the decision, and then um, the outcome, if it's positive, reinforces making that same decision again in the future. Likewise, uh, the opposite is true for a negative dopamine signal. So we'll see that dopamine can kind of go both ways. It can get a positive dopamine signal, an increase in dopamine. You can also get a decrease in dopamine below your kind of baseline. And that decrease actually reinforces this complementary no-go pathway. And what that logic suggests is that if you uh, make a out, if you made it made a decision, um, and it, you got a negative outcome, okay, from having made that decision, this pathway basically says maybe next time you shouldn't do that. Okay, so if it doesn't turn out good, you know, if you if you eat that uh, pastrami sandwich that looks so good, and then you have this really bad tummy feeling afterwards, that negative tummy feeling gives you that kind of no-go signal that says next time, maybe we shouldn't have that. So this uh, is, is kind of, again, coming after the fact and, and sort of overriding a previous choice that was to go and saying, no, we should actually not go on that kind of situation again based on this negative outcome. So this logic is actually known as Thorndike's Law of Effect. It is critical to the 1950s kind of behaviorists uh, tradition, the classic classical conditioning kind of paradigms. And so uh, this has been known for a long time and we now know that the dopamine pathways really directly implement this kind of uh, very intuitive learning mechanism uh, in their effects on these two different basal ganglia pathways.